Ardiff looked out the viewport. It's still not over yet, sir, but it was. And deep down, Pelion was sure Ardiff knew it as well as he did. A thousand systems left out of an empire that had once spanned a million. Two hundred Star Destroyers remaining from a fleet that had once included over 25,000 of them. Spectre of the Past, book one of the Thrawn duology, does a good job of setting up the dire straits of the Empire at about 19 years after the Battle of Yavin. The Empire has crumbled, and even the ultimate symbol of their power, their massive starfleet, has now dwindled to a hundredth of its former power. But how is that possible? How, in less than two decades, did the Empire manage to lose over 20,000 Star Destroyers? That's what we'll be examining on today's video. So the information for this video obviously changes depending on whether we're examining canon or legends. Today we will be looking at Star Wars Legends, but if you'd like me to also take a crack at canon, make sure to like this video and let me know down below. With Legends, however, there's no one clear answer. Rather Rather, it was a variety of factors which caused the Empire to lose the majority of their fleet, from mismanagement, a lack of a central leader after Palpatine, Imperial infighting, defections and ship captures, and of course, major events like Operation Shadow Hand. I think it makes most sense to examine the losses chronologically. Let's start first with the Battle of Endor, and Endor, like with the destruction of the first Death Star, represented a serious loss of leadership for the Empire. Not only, of course, was the Emperor killed along with Lord Vader, but the second Death Star was destroyed, as was the Executor and a fairly large portion of Death Squadron. All of these assets would have had the best of the best within the Empire stationed on them, and thus the sort of brain drain would make the loss of ships even more common, just because the officers, whether commanding the ship or performing secondary duties, would have just been of, well, lesser quality. On several occasions, Pelion in the Thrawn trilogy, and later remarks that the young age of those on the bridge of the various Star Destroyers, and later the Empire more heavily takes on women, and later even allows aliens into their rank. That being said, the loss of Palpatine himself was the much, much more serious issue. When it came to the Imperial Throne, there was no line of secession. There was no one who could step into Palpatine's position and command the loyalty of the Imperial Starfleet. For example, after the Battle of Endor, the remaining Imperial ships first heeded the orders of the ranking officer due to deaths, Captain Pelion, but after the escape, they basically broke up and went their own separate ways. This basically represented how all Imperial Starfleets acted. While some did fall to the ruling council, which was perhaps the most legitimate successor, the majority of resources went elsewhere, whether the Deep Core, back to their home systems, or perhaps falling into the service of the now dozens of warlords which were beginning to claim power. The creation of warlords and mini imperial states was incredibly important to the New Republic anyway, because although it meant that the New Republic did not have another head of state that they could quickly kill and weaken the Imperials further, it also meant that the thousands of fleets across the galaxy were no longer unified under a single leader. We had fleets which swore loyalty to the Deep Core Warlords, or Artis Kane and the Pentastar Alignment, or Warlord Zinge, or dozens of others as I said. But not only were they not attacking the New Republic in any sort of coordinated way, the Warlords were also jostling against each other. Zinge, for example, would often encroach on the territory of both smaller and other large Warlords. And the key is, many didn't see themselves as a second empire or a continuation of the empire, rather their own new thing. So their first primary goal wouldn't have been continuing the war against the New Republic, but rather establishing and protecting their own territory. So right away, ships would have been bled due to infighting by being prey to larger New Republic fleets without the support of other Imperials, and just lost due to essentially falling into private hands and disappearing. Interestingly, this loss of ships is kind of similar to a strategy used by the Rebel Alliance. Even when Palpatine was alive, the Empire was heavily fractured, and the Alliance would sometimes attack on the edge of a territory belonging to a certain moth, 
Knowing that because high imperial officials guarded their assets so closely, it was unlikely that a moth in a neighboring sector would send out any ships for support. The post-Endor era was sort of like this, but magnified, because now there was a massive power vacuum and the Imperials were killing each other, basically, to try to gain that position. By two or three years after the Battle of Endor, the New Republic was making inroads to the Inner Rim and the Core, managing to attack smaller warlords, or even planets not formally under control of a warlord, but which had a small Imperial defense force occupying it. One good example of this would be Bakura, which the Alliance of Free Planets, as the New Republic was called at the time, managed to essentially free from the Empire. And one of Bakura's major problems was that no Imperial defense forces were nearby to aid them. What does this have to do with losing Star Destroyers though? Well, essentially the point is that even though the New Republic had only a few ships, it allowed them to be the dominant force in many of the battles that they engaged the Empire in. In the first few years, and especially before the Battle of Coruscant, they weren't really hitting up against any large Imperial forces. This was also a period of defection, and I think people really, really underestimate the amount of Star Destroyers and other ships that the Empire either lost or had captured. For example, the Hapen Navy managed to secure several dozen Imperial Star Destroyers in the years after the Battle of Endor, and they were a pretty small and certainly very isolationist faction. The New Republic's early years were focused on diplomacy, and many planets flocked to join their ranks. Many of these would have had ships belonging to the Empire technically under their command, and one of the major things that Mon Mothma pushed for was what was called the Defense Declarations, which was an executive order basically denationalizing planetary security forces. And what that means is that if a planet like Corellia had a defense fleet, instead of that belonging to the Empire, it would actually be in control of Corellia. Here's what the Essential Guide to Warfare says about this pivotal decision. The Defense Declarations devolved control of planetary security forces nationalized by the Empire to their sectors. New Republic member sectors would be expected to support the military Starfleet, but would retain command of their local forces. Word of the defense declarations rippled through the galaxy. Sectors loyal to the Empire, or at least by powerful moths, dismissed the measure as illegal. But for others, it was the deciding factor that led them to break with the Empire or join the New Republic. And some sectors' loyalties proved sharply divided, leading to hundreds of battles between rival Imperial task forces that further diminished the Empire's ability to wage war. So yeah, not only did planets and their defense forces join the New Republic, that would have included some Star Destroyers, but it also caused further infighting. As the war progressed, another major issue for the Empire was the loss of their major shipyards. Fondor, for example, was seized very early, while other planets like Corellia and Kuat joined the New Republic. This meant that not only did the Empire lose its ability to make ships, something that the Thrawn trilogy really explores, but the New Republic was now heavily militarizing. Mon Calamari and the Defense Forces generally created several new ship designs and cruisers were being pumped out. At this point, the New Republic would have been able to take on the Empire at a larger scale. The New Republic was not only capturing Star Destroyers at this point, but even Dreadnoughts like the Lusenkia and the later Guardian. A common tactic, as we'd see during the Battle of Endor, would be to overwhelm the enemy and then just require surrender, then taking the vessels. And this seemed to be so successful that even the New Republic's successor state, the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances, was still relying heavily on old Imperial class Star Destroyers to make up much of their navy. One of the largest warlords at this time, and the largest for sure after the death of Zinj, was Grand Moff Artis Kane of the Pentastar Alignment. Kane had a lot of resources at his disposal, including a Super Star Destroyer, but he was almost completely non-aggressive against the New Republic. So basically, he had a lot of ships tied up doing nothing as, and I quote, patient diplomacy and the defense declarations had divided the Imperial military, with many deciding that their loyalties lay with their home sectors, not the vacillating ruling council. As moths and admirals with Imperial ambitions of their own had begun battling over territory. Kane really kind of squandered an opportunity, because he had the opportunity to attack Mon Calamari in force and was in position to do so after Endor, but instead he withdrew to essentially secure his holdings. And it wasn't until Thrawn that we see a real coordinated effort amongst various Imperial sub-factions. That being said, Thrawn didn't really pull from Imperial resources across the galaxy. He did take some from the Pentastar alignment, but most of his resources came from the remains of Death Squadron. He 
purposely left other Imperial fleets in defensive positions. Notably, however, Thrawn's death brought chaos across the galaxy, and the New Republic used that to take large swaths of territory, attacking, for example, Krennel and his hegemony. However, by this point, the Empire, on a totality, still held the balance of power in the galaxy. This would change with Operation Shadow Hand. There were two main factors that led to ship loss. First of all, ships began mysteriously leaving their posts and heading towards the Deep Core. New Republic Intelligence thought that one of the warlords in that area had gained prominence, as even important planets were left undefended. Then, however, an invasion fleet led by 12 dreadnoughts and presumably a similarly massive support fleet took the core as the Empire united for the first time to flex its power. However, shortly after the Blitz, there was a massive Imperial mutiny, which shredded the Empire's fleets and killed many capable officers. It's very likely that thousands of ships, including the majority of the Empire's remaining dreadnoughts, were destroyed at this time. As the Essential Guide to Warfare says, the Empire would limp along under a succession of leaders after this point, but its dreams of reconquering the galaxy were dead. The New Republic would also use this point to claim territory that was under the control of the Empire, including even more shipyards. However, the Empire would have also lost massive resources during the destruction of Biss, which was blown up by the Empire's own galaxy gun. Here is where the scales tip. Even as the Warlords unified at Toss Beacon, or rather they were killed, and a large portion of the Empire was unified by Dala, the New Republic now was more powerful than the Galactic Empire. Dala squandered Imperial Command, losing perhaps dozens of Star Destroyers and one of the Empire's last Super Star Destroyers. Then Command moved to Admiral Pelion, who completely changed Imperial Doctrine, deciding to move out of the core and into the Outer Rim. He realized that the Empire was now not powerful enough to fight the New Republic directly, and instead went on the defensive. However, his Council of Moths argued for one last offensive, which led to the kind of disastrous Arinda campaign. Although the Empire did secure some victories, in the end they lost even more Dreadnoughts and Blood Star Destroyers. This essentially leads us to the position of the Empire in the Thrawn duology, a much smaller faction which now can't even make its own TIE fighters. The Empire would gain a bit more power as they made peace with the New Republic and took some more territory in the aftermath of the Yuuzhan Vong War and the later Second Galactic Civil War. However, they wouldn't truly gain power again until the Legacy Era, which we can discuss in a later video. But did you enjoy this information? Is there anything I missed? Do you have any further questions? Let me know all that and more down in the comments. If you haven't already, consider following me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and do all those things. Until next time though guys, this has been Eckhart's Ladder. Have a great day, and may the Force be with you.